Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Stacey Sennett, Program Director at the National Kidney Foundation serving New England. I would like to thank everyone for joining. As we wait for additional attendees to join the webinar, I would like to take some time to go over some features you can utilize during our presentation. All attendees have been muted, and for any questions, please use the Q&A window. The Q&A window will allow you to ask questions to the presenters. To locate the Q&A window, hover your mouse over the screen, Click the Q&A tab. Once open, you can type in your question into the Q&A box. Click send. The speakers will then answer your question live after the presentation. We can't promise all questions will be answered due to time commitments, but we will do our best. Again, thank you for joining this afternoon. I would like to welcome Medical Director of Kidney and Pancreas Transplant Program at Brigham and Women's Hospital, Dr. Chan Drieger. So thank you everybody for joining today um, and welcome to our latest um, Kidney Crossroads collaboration between the Brigham and Women's Hospital and the National Kidney Foundation of New England. Uh, we started this series of uh, events really to connect with our patients. Uh, we realized that there's a real opportunity for us to host events on topical uh, subjects that patients interested in and would prefer to get answers directly from their healthcare professionals. We're very uh, fortunate that National Kidney Foundation has uh, agreed to host uh, these meetings. This will be not one of the scheduled events that we've held. We've held, we hold them generally speaking every two months. But this one was a special one because uh, of the concern that we've heard from our patients about the rates of antibody formation after COVID. And we think that this is a very topical area and that this would be a very easy way for us to communicate uh, with patients uh, in general. We also opened this up uh, for the first time in heart and lung transplantation uh, at the Brigham and Women's Hospital because uh, the issues are the same uh, for all transplanted patients. And today we're very fortunate to be joined uh, by Dr. Anne Woolley. Uh, Dr. Woolley is an infectious disease specialist and she's the Associate Clinical Director of Infectious Diseases at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. She's also been uh, conducting a study uh, looking at the uh, antibody response in patients who get COVID vaccination. And today she's going to go over some of the questions uh, that have come up uh, or that regularly come up from patients in terms of concerns about the vaccination and also present some of the data uh, from the study. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Anne. Uh, there'll be an opportunity to answer uh, questions that you pose in the um, chat box and the Q&A. And we'll do that at the end where we'll have a panel discussion. Thank you so much, Dr. Shandrager. One second and I will share my screen. All right. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for um, having us today, Dr. Shandricker, for organizing this. And thank you to all of our transplant patients, uh, first, who have participated in the study that we'll be talking about today and for joining uh, today. I'd like to thank my colleagues uh, um, in the transplant program here at the Brigham who helped to support this. Let me take a step back before we get into um, talking about what does it mean to be a transplant patient and to have received COVID vaccination. And let's talk a little bit about what vaccination does and what does it mean to have immunity from vaccination or from natural infection. So when we think about our immune system, we think about their innate immune system and our adaptive immune response. When we think about vaccination, it really impacts our adaptive immune response. So in doing so, it focuses then on activating 
two sets of our cells. Our B cells, which is where we then form our antibodies from plasma cells, as well as our cellular immunity, or we talk about as our T cell response. Once our cells that have been activated, our immune cells, reach the target tissue, we then know that we have our T cells are very important because they become a killer or cytotoxic T cells that detect specific virus fragments on the surface of infected cells and can destroy them, eliminating essentially the virus factory, if you will. Antibodies that are secreted by B cells bind to the surface of the virus and block the host entry. And that is what we mean by neutralizing antibodies. And so when we think about how do we know and measure the response to vaccination, it's important that we not just focus on antibodies because that really only tells half the story, but our T cell or cellular immunity is also very important. However, that's a much more difficult one to measure and we don't have readily accessible commercial labs in order to be able to test this. It's much more of a research lab. So though most of the discussion will be about antibodies, I just wanna bring up from the beginning about the fact that it's really only half of the story when we think about this. So what do we know when we think about COVID vaccination and transplant patients? Well, we're fortunate that in the past few months, as we know with COVID, we have had a rapid accumulation of data. And since the COVID vaccines, our first two messenger RNA vaccines, the Pfizer and Moderna, were uh, EUA approved by the FDA in December, and then started to roll out into uh, the patients being able to have access to vaccination. And we are so fortunate here at the Brigham and at Mass General to be able to offer to our transplant patients beginning in the middle of January. So what we know so far from other studies, Hopkins and some other studies outside of the US in Israel and France, that we have about five studies that have looked at what is the antibody response after vaccination in solid organ transplant patients. Those five studies incorporate a bit more than a thousand patients and it's all organs, hearts, lungs, kidneys, liver, dual organs. And what we've seen is anywhere up to 50% of transplant recipients develop a positive antibody after the second dose of the messenger RNA vaccines, Pfizer or Moderna, which are the ones that have been looked at and published on. And I say up to because these studies vary into how efficacious they are and also vary across organs. We have one study just as of this earlier this week that came out just in lungs and a small study, but did show us that if you looked at those individuals who did not mount an antibody after vaccination, a third of them did mount a detectable, uh, did have T cell response showing us again, T cells being very important and perhaps in those who don't mount an antibody response, doesn't mean that they won't have any protection. And then fortunately, what we have seen over and over again in the general population, but also in our transplant patients is how safe vaccination is. And so we've seen that there's been no concern for rejection or other serious adverse events in the early period following vaccination. But what do we not know? And I could obviously go on and on with slides about what we don't know yet. But I think the two key things for us to realize at this point is that what we don't have is the clinical effectiveness data. Meaning we don't know if you've been vaccinated and you're a transplant patient from a randomized controlled trial, who are those that are going to be protected from actually developing infection? What we have and what we talked about above the antibody response and the T cell response studies that looks at our immunogenicity. Those are really lab studies, if you will. But what the clinical trials that were done that led to the approval of these vaccinations in the general population, what they looked at and what their endpoints on were clinical disease. Did an individual develop COVID? And if so, what was the severity of the disease? We're starting to have some case series reported of breakthrough vaccination in all patients, but also in some transplant patients, but we don't really know the clinical effectiveness. And I think that's important when we think about this because I wanna make sure I frame this in a way that though we'll be focusing on the antibody responses, that not only does that not tell the full story when it comes to immunity, but it also does not tell us whether or not truly clinically it protects you from the infection. We also then don't know longer term immunity. 
And I'm not just referring to what, not knowing about how long an antibody response will last, because that we're still looking for knowing that in the general population, but also looking to see, is it a case that if you have mounted a response after the second dose, but maybe a minimal response or no response at all, would you be more likely to develop a response later on? Would it take patients longer in the transplant group to mount a response? So those are some of the things we don't know. And then of course, the other big thing that we don't know, and not just in transplant patients, but in general, is what is what we call the correlate for immune protection? Meaning, what are these things that we've talked about? Antibody responses, T cell responses, so many other things in regards to the immune system actually correlates to true clinical protection. And of these things, is it enough just to have an antibody or a T cell response? Or what is the level that's needed? And again, I wanna bring this up up front because I think it's very key for us when we think about all the data as it's beginning to come out and as we have today's discussion. So what we did was try to assess the safety and efficacy of COVID vaccination in our solid organ transplant recipients. We did this in a number of ways. What I'll be presenting on today is the fact that we measured antibody responses weekly using a dried blood spot card technique pictured here. And so this was in an effort to get more frequent values, knowing that just a one-time antibody test doesn't tell the full story, and also to be able to have this be more convenient for each patients to be able to do at home and then bring it back to us when they came for their second vaccine dose and then mail it back to us at the end, at the uh, two months mark, four to five weeks after the second dose. So when we think about the distribution overall, so this is a pie chart here that, that in colors shows the different organ types. So you can see here a little bit less than 50% of the total 309 patients that we enrolled in our study had were kidney transplant recipients, followed by 71 of the 309 being an orange, our lung transplant recipients. The green there are lung, excuse me, our heart transplant recipients, followed by a small portion of liver transplants. And then we have there the remainder of our dual organ, liver, kidney, heart, lung, heart, kidney, and kidney pancreas. 57% of these participants were females, and the vast majority, 97%, received Pfizer vaccination. So now I'd like to take us through some of the results here. And what I did here in order to try to make sure it's, again, we're talking about the key findings from this, not to get too detail-oriented here. I split this up into, as you can see on the column here, the characteristics, and really just pulling out some of the key things that we saw. Age, number of years out from transplant, organ type, and whether or not you had a prior transplant. And seeing, did that matter to those that mounted an antibody response compared to those who didn't? So the overall value, first of all, is thinking about 89, of our total had a developed an antibody after the second dose of the vaccination. So were you more likely to mount that if you were younger in age? So this is just comparing without adjusting for all the other variables, just looking at this and though you can see that it is significant, a p-value of less than 0.05 showing that it is significant if you're younger, but it's not a great age difference as you can see there. Then for number of years out from transplant, grouping it by one year, two year, and then three to five years, six to 10 years, up to 15 years, and then greater than 16 years, you see that that does make a difference, that the further out you are from transplant seems to show that you are more likely then to have a positive antibody. And then what about different organ types? So again, here, it does trend that if you were to have had a thoracic organ transplant, lung or heart, compared to kidney or liver, you were less likely to have an antibody that was positive. Having a prior transplant and having this be your second transplant or third, um, though we had small numbers overall, did not seem to be significant. But now I'd like to go through the immunosuppression. And I put here in red, the three immunosuppressive agents that we saw that did seem to impact the, whether or not individuals had an antibody that was positive after their second dose of the vaccine. You see here, mycophenolate or MMF was if there are a smaller percentage of patients that had a positive antibody were on that immunosuppressive regimen compared to azathioprine being a greater percentage. And then what's interesting is prednisone. Though that was significant that those that were on prednisone 
were less likely to have a positive antibody response. The key thing here is not what we would necessarily think that, oh, it's because these individuals were on higher doses of prednisone, but no, the vast majority of these were on five milligrams or less of prednisone. Having rejection in the prior six months, we had few individuals that did, um, and that did not seem to matter. And then I looked at the absolute lymphocyte count. As you know, when we measure your blood levels, um, looking at your white blood cell count and what makes that up. And again, this goes to our immune system, our lymphocytes, and showing that if you have an absolute lymphocyte count slightly higher, you are less like, you're more likely to have a positive antibody response, though that's likely in relation and keeping with our immunosuppressive agents that you're on. And then this incorporated patients that had had a prior history of COVID of which there were 11 here. And as you see that all but one had a positive antibody, but they had a positive antibody when they came into the study pre-vaccination and then continued to have a positive antibody post-vaccination. And then as far as our outcomes, we had three individuals that had COVID that were enrolled in our study after um, being vaccinated. And, of, and um, all three of these were after fully vaccinated two weeks uh, or more after their second dose. And two of the three had a negative antibody, but one had a positive antibody. That individual was then hospitalized in the ICU, not for respiratory issues, um, and ultimately did well and was discharged home. There was one individual in our study, unfortunately, who did pass away, but was not due to COVID and was unrelated. But now this is all looking at all these different characteristics. I wanna then take a step back and see when we did our multivariate or logistic regression to see what were the key factors that contributed most when you adjusted for all these other factors. And we found three key things that mattered. So these were the factors that most contributed to having a positive antibody. And that was if you had an abdominal organ transplant, kidney or liver, rather than a thoracic organ transplant, and the um, uh, odds ratio for that was 150, so it was 2.57. It was 157% times more likely that you would have a positive antibody if you had an abdominal organ transplant compared to a thoracic organ transplant. And then as far as for the number of years out from transplant, it continued to increase between the one year to the 10 years, but it started to then really plateau. And it really showed that if you were more than 10 years out from transplant, you had then more significant chance of having a positive antibody. And here in this graph, it is a graphic that shows that. And what you see on the horizontal axis here is a number of years out from transplant compared to the odds ratio or the likelihood of having a positive antibody. As you can see, the line starts to increase and continues to increase yearly about until you get to around the 10-year mark. And once you get around the 10-year mark, you see it then starts to plateau and showing there that you're more likely then after 10 years to have had, if you're 10 years out from transplant, to have a positive antibody, which is not surprising as we know from the standpoint of level of immunosuppression, et cetera. And then of all the different immunosuppressives, when we then adjusted for all the other variables, the only one that was significant was for those individuals who were not on mycophenolate, they were more likely to. So this is overall the findings, but I wanna then go through what this meant and how this changed on a weekly basis. So here, this is looking at all of our individuals. This is what we call a violin plot. It's looking at on the horizontal axis, those uh, samples that we received at baseline, meaning right before vaccination, and then every week up to the seven to 10 week mark. On the other axis, when labeled here as RBD, that's the receptor binding domain that we measured of the spike protein, which is our antibody response. The red horizontal line is the threshold for a positive antibody response. And then the green marks here, the first one being the first vaccine dose and the second green line indicating when the second vaccine dose was. And what this shows overall is that the majority of these blue violin plots here are under the red line, showing what we just went through as far as the um, low percentage of those individuals that did mount an antibody response overall. But what I'd like to go into more with this is for those who did develop a positive antibody response, how did that change? Where, when did they develop this positive antibody? Was it after their first dose or their second dose? And seeing this by organ, how does this differ? 
So here is what we call a box and whiskers plot. It looks at the different organs, lung in blue, kidney in orange, heart in green, and liver in red. And you see here the very few after the first dose had a positive antibody response as compared to after the second dose. But it wasn't even as we see in healthy volunteers that you develop that right away at this two week mark as what we're considered fully vaccinated. But it really takes a little bit longer to continue to have that positive antibody. And that's why we're wondering whether or not it would help to continue to be checking these antibodies greater on as we are starting to do now at the three and four month mark would they continue to have more likelihood of developing a positive antibody? But now we talked about lacking a correlate for immune protection, meaning what does it mean just to have an antibody? But also you see here the variability of even the value itself of the antibody response. So this is not just about yes or no if you have an antibody, but what is the value with this uh, antibody test? And does that matter? So this is the same individuals we just looked at in that prior graph of those that transplant patients that all developed a positive antibody, but now comparing it to healthy volunteers using the same antibody assay over the same time periods. And as you can see, the um, dots in black, which are the healthy individuals, that as the more, a greater percentage of those develop a positive antibody response and are over that red line, after their first dose compared to the blue transplant patients. But also what's very interesting, I think very important to look at is the span at which you have these values for those that were positive. Showing again that does it matter if you are just having a positive antibody and you're over this threshold or does it matter where you are with this and what will that do over time? And that's very key to know and also goes to why we don't recommend having antibodies checked clinically and getting that value because we don't know what that really means. And you can see the widespread here for healthy volunteers. Now I'd like to transition and talk about um, some recommendations and what we think about in terms of how this applies to what we would counsel our patients on and what we've already said. So what we looked for here is um, I tried to put down some of the questions that we received from our patients and think about it as far as examples of different activities. And then for those vaccinated individuals that are not transplant patients compared to vaccinated transplant patients, and then focus on the outdoor activities compared to the indoor activities. The different colors here, green, yellow, and red, green being least, red being most, is as far as the risk of different activities. And then here, masks, as far as wearing masks on it. Um, and so if you look for some of these activities, uh, outdoors, walking, running, small gatherings um, with vaccinated individuals compared to vaccinated, unvaccinated, dining at a restaurant outdoors, attending a crowded event. So we know overall, most of these events are considered low risk and green. Um, and for vaccinated individuals, we know the CDC is now recommending that they will not need to wear masks. And excuse me for the um, mistake with the uh, mask uh, motions there. They should not be there for the, um, the vaccinated parts there for the green. But for vaccinated transplant patients, what does this mean? Is it still safe for vaccinated transplant patients to be outdoors, walking or running with household members, not wearing a mask? Yes. Is it safe for vaccinated transplant patients to be in a small gathering with all other vaccinated family and friends in a small gathering that they're aware of or vaccinated? Yes. What about vaccinated and unvaccinated? And this is when, and I apologize, this is where the mask um, should be from the left hand side of that. They definitely should be wearing masks in these settings for vaccinated transplant patients. And also though overall, we still consider this being outdoor a lower risk, but that's when we're starting to increase the risk. Dining at a restaurant with multiple households, we know increases that, and we would not recommend that our transplant patients attend crowded events at all. Indoors, we have to think about, again, more and more greater risk and what the recommendation would be for this. And so I know it's not just a case what people are asking us as far as what is the risk of doing this and whether or not to wear a mask, but the bigger question is, is it recommended? 
And I think the main thing that we have to say is that it all has to be done on a case by case basis. But unfortunately, I think we do need to say until we get more information that we know the vaccinated transplant patients do not respond the same as non transplant or non immunosuppressed patients to the vaccine. And to what that actually means and to what the clinical protection is and who then gets COVID for those that have been vaccinated, we need more information on that. And so at this point, we're not recommending those activities and are thinking that it's really important that we are uh, continue to encourage vaccination in our transplant patients because we know that does lead to benefit, but that we are continue to remain very cautious in the activities and continue with our social distancing and mitigation measures. So I'd like to pause there and thank you all for um, this and for be participating um, in this. We wanted to make sure that we left a lot of time um, for questions. But before we did that, we wanted to transition to two questions that we had for you all to answer uh, for our polling questions. So I'm going to uh, stop sharing my screen here and ask if uh, Stacey will put those two questions up. We're at 82%. Thank you. And then can we go to the next question? A few more seconds left for the poll. We're at 79%. Great, I just wanted to take a moment for this question. Um, is that a common question that we get is, is it recommended for transplant patients that they don't mount a good response um, to get a third dose or a booster vaccine? And right now the recommendations are not to do so um, unless it is in a setting of a study. And that's why we're asking how many individuals would be interested in potentially participating in a study, because it's very important that if we were to proceed with this, to have it be done under a study setting in order to make sure that we are continuing to measure the safety of this when we think about it in terms of rejection, and other potential things we want to measure closely uh, post-vaccination like we did for the first two doses. Right, so I will end there. And Dr. Schondraker, if um, we can turn this over for questions. Right, and thank you very much. Um, I really appreciate you uh, uh, sharing uh, the results because these are, I think the first time the results of the Brigham study have been shared. Um, and so, you know, this is actually, um, is great to actually share it with our patients uh, for the first time because normally these things get shared in the academic literature and then find their way uh, to the community in a more indirect fashion. So um, I'd like to invite our other two panelists to also join the conversation. We've had a number of questions that have uh, come in and um, I will sort of take an, obviously the majority of questions are for Dr. Woolley <laughs> uh, as she uh, gave the talk. And so I think I will just start with uh, the questions as they came in. And so uh, the first question is, um, and this is a question that we see a lot from our patients. Um, can you speak a little bit about the different types of antibody testing that 
uh, there is for um, uh, following uh, for, for COVID, you know, the difference between the testing for antibodies against spikes and against uh, the nuclear fact. And what does that mean? Because people are always asking, should they get an antibody test? And they don't necessarily realize that there are different types of tests. And the second part to that question would be, um, is there a level at which you would consider uh, the antibody result to be protective uh, against uh, COVID-19? Yes, thank you for that question. Because I think that first part is so critical when we think about uh, the recommendations of both the CDC and the FDA, and the FDA recommendation coming out in the past two weeks about why they're not recommending uh, checking antibodies clinically and then reacting or you know, responding to those results. And so why we don't do this routinely on a clinical way. Because of the fact there are different um, types, um, as you mentioned, Dr. Schendricker, for antibodies that we can test to. Um, when we think about the SARS-CoV-2 virus and the different portions of the proteins there that we're looking for. And so if we are looking for um, an antibody that would see it could be positive from having natural infection, that's called the N protein part or the nucleocapsid part of it, as compared to the spike protein, which is what gives the SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus that you see with all those spikes around it. That's the receptor binding domain of the spike protein of the virus that is then targeted for the vaccine and also what you can then test for antibodies. That test can be positive after an antibody, uh, excuse me, after a natural infection as well as after vaccination. But it's very important because those, uh, the spike protein ones, antibody tests are harder to find um, and to get clinically. And so if you're asking your uh, providers, your primary care doctors or other uh, physicians to order these tests for you, you need to be very careful because many are ordering the N protein on the nuclear capsid after vaccination. And that is not, that would never be, we would not expect that to be positive after vaccination. Um, so that was the first part. The second question as far as the level of it. And so it's very important with these to know how these tests were studied. So these tests were not validated for being able to see what level would be needed after vaccination. They are not approved this way. And so therefore, this is also why it's not recommended to do this clinically. And so why we used this research test um, in collaboration with the Broad Institute in their lab to look at this uh, assay, for which we have then studied it in other healthy volunteers that have been vaccinated. But what we don't know in any of these assays is what is the right level that is needed? Is it just enough to have a positive or do you need to have a very high level or not? And that's why we showed that one graph that showed just the variability within even healthy individuals um, from having a positive antibody, but from a low level to a very high level of the antibody. Thanks, and, and you know, I think one of the questions, I'm gonna sort of incorporate a number of questions into one question. And I think this is one that we, get you know very commonly i mean you talked a little bit about what activities are you know viewed as being higher risk and medium risk and, and lower risk um but i think a, a lot of patients are concerned about going back to work so they've been vaccinated they want to go back to work or their work is uh, asking them to come back and yet you know they're not they're being told that they're at higher risk even after they're vaccinated developing COVID and they're being it's suggested that they take extra precautions. So how do we advise patients about uh, dealing with going back to work, depending on the different circumstances? They may be working uh, with people who are unvaccinated uh, as well as vaccinated. And that goes a little bit to your activity thing. So I'd ask you first, Anne, and then I would like to ask Dr. Giverts and Dr. Sharma uh, to comment on, on what they're advising their patients. Sure. So my advice for that is that, again, I think it has to be a case by case basis as to where you work and what conditions um, can be taken into account when you work to make sure that you are able to maintain your distance um, and uh, from other individuals that you're working with. And it doesn't mean that you have to be um, completely working alone. It just means that you need to be able to wear a mask in a setting where you know other individuals will be encouraged to wear masks and that you can have your distance of six feet away and be able to um, really feel comfortable that you have some distance with that. So to me, that is, I think, the um, what I would recommend. And I uh, definitely think as far as vaccination uh, status goes, by being vaccinated, it only helps you and should help you feel more comfortable in that while still maintaining social distancing and mask wearing. Dr. Givitz, any comments? Well, yeah, this is a common and a question. I think, uh, as you say, uh, uh, Dr. Woolley, it has to be individualized. I think if 
you know, if a patient is going back to work, let's say in an office setting, um, again, where there is uh, spacing and there is, uh, you know, interaction perhaps with colleagues, but not with a general public. It would be different, for example, if a patient was going back to a job where they were uh, continually being exposed more directly with um, the general public, let's say, in a food service industry or something like that. Um, and we have to assume that in those situations, particularly as we open back up, there is going to be patients who have not patients, there, is, there are going to be members of the public who have chosen not to get vaccinated and certainly could be uh, asymptomatic carriers of the virus. So I think it has to be individualized, but you know, I would encourage uh, a patient to speak directly with their clinician to discuss not only their clinical situation, their medications, um, their history of infection, um, and also the nature of the work they're actually going back to. Yes, thank you. Uh, you know, I agree with Dr. Bully and Dr. Giberts. These things have to be individualized. You know, uh, as you already saw in the graph, I mean, the lung transplant patients, definitely thoracic patients are mounting less of a response. Uh, it's general goes with the fact that many of our lung transplant patients have a higher levels of immunosuppression that we keep, especially in the first year or first few years that say. Uh, so my general advice would be that Again, it's a case-by-case -case basis. If you have the luxury of working from home uh, without having any, you know, no pressures from your employer, I think that is the safest way. Uh, but if uh, that is not an option, certainly, uh, you know, a secure workplace is important where you can mask and you are aware of uh, uh, the people around you. They are masked and there are proper precautions. Uh, not necessarily six feet distancing, the farther the better. I mean, there are enough studies to show six feet may not be enough, but at least physical distancing uh, so that the things are not crowded. And of course, you know, once you relive your life normally, uh, you have to use judgment uh, going to places. Hopefully uh, you could still enjoy life, go to places when there is uh, less crowd. For example, I've had patients ask me about going to church uh, my uh, suggestion to them has been, well, uh, going to church is important for them. So uh, perhaps they could go at a time when there are not lots of people in the church, uh, rather than going to a, a regular uh, gathering uh, with a lot of people in there. Uh, so again, you know, this is all individualized. There are certain patients who may not, who may be even higher risk than others, especially those who have received high doses of steroids or other immunomodulatory therapies due to rejection. Uh, so please feel free to contact us, uh, you know, any of our team members and we'll be happy to give you individualized uh, suggestions. Yeah, and I would echo those thoughts. I mean, I think, you know, obviously, you know, people are concerned because you know, uh, we've encouraged all of our patients to get vaccinated. And that is true. And we saw from the poll that most people are vaccinated. And I think you know, everybody understands the importance of being vaccinated. You know, I think the problem is that being vaccinated does not uh, eliminate the risk, uh, particularly in immunosuppressed patients. It decreases the risk, but it doesn't eliminate it. And so, you know, while these precautions are concerning that you know, we have to take these precautions in our patients, we're getting more information, you know, week by week. Uh, we are modifying the way that we, um, Think about doing this. You know, there are other studies that will become available. So I think it's not going to be forever. And at the same time, you know, the rate of vaccination within the general population is also increasing, and therefore the risk is, is decreasing with that. So while you know there is obviously concern about this, um, you know, we have to realize that things will improve, and that you know it is worth uh, you know staying the course and taking the precautions. Uh, but it's not going to be forever. So the, the next set of questions was really about immunosuppression. And, you know, so I think one of the things that you showed, Dr. Lee, and I think it's come out from the uh, other studies as well, is that uh, patients on certain types of immunosuppression seem to mount less of an antibody response uh, than other patients. And, you know, the question is really, uh, is this of concern you know, uh, are there recommendations that we would make uh, in terms of immunosuppression? Uh, uh, I will, again, I'll go to all three panelists, but I'll start with you, 
Pat Ann, and then go to Michael and then Rob. Sure. What um, what I think is very important to uh, take from this is that just because that was seen that being on uh, mycophenolate was seen to have um, less proportion of those patients um, had developed a positive antibody response. It is not at all that that should then inform us to action as far as to not to stop that and uh, immunosuppression. Um, I think if anything, the importance of that um, needs to be the fact of that knowing that those individuals who are on those in, uh, medications or on mycophenolate can be at a higher risk then after vaccination for developing COVID and have to be even more careful. And so I really think the key things here, if I can, and let the other panelists answer the questions more about immunosuppression is to say that when we identify in our study or in the other studies that have been out there, what are the key factors that are leading people to having less likely chance of developing an antibody? It's not about necessarily changing those factors because we know as transplant patients, those are the key factors in actually having the most important thing, which is the graft survival and ongoing doing so well from your transplant. So the key things with that is identifying who within our transplant group are less likely to have as good of a response after vaccination and therefore need to be more careful in their mitigation responses. So to me, I take from this that if you're on that to be more careful, but that that should not be something that you think about changing just because of that factor. Michael? Yeah, no, I, I just want to uh, reemphasize that, that last point uh, that, that uh, Dr. Woolley made. We do not want patients uh, changing their immunosuppression in the hopes of having a better antibody response to a vaccination, i.e. taking less of their immunosuppression or altering the dose without uh, discussion with their providers. I hope that's very clear. Nirmal? Yes, I completely agree with that. You know, uh, I want to add another simple you know, thought process here. So, you know, whenever you have a, a transplant, whether lung transfer or heart, uh, at some point, you know, the reason we keep optimal immunosuppression is to allow for tolerance in the body where your body and the transfer organ uh, try to live in harmony, if I may uh, you know, make it easy to understand. And you have to understand that as soon as we reduce immunosuppression, sometimes we have no choice. So we do that in, in the setting of infections or you know, other conditions. But if we, choose, if we you know, change the level of immunosuppression just for this, we are at very high risk for graft dysfunction. That means the transplanted organ, uh, especially I, I, I can speak for lungs, uh, they can seriously undergo you know, the process of uh, rejection or chronic rejection or sometimes even acute rejection. So I think it's very, very important that uh, yes, it sounds great that we can reduce the immunosuppression and perhaps mount a better response, but for the larger good of the organ, we must stay the course. And uh, this is a very uh, fine thread uh, to balance. So my suggestion would be same like others. Uh, please do not change your immunosuppression uh, without consulting with your clinicians. Yeah, absolutely concur with that. I hope that everybody understands that. Um, so, Anne, um, another question is about the different types of vaccines. Um, there's been some discussion um, about patients who get one type of vaccine. So, first of all, is there a difference between the different types of vaccine? Firstly, secondly, um, is there any benefit to the dose of one vaccine and then a second dose of a different vaccine or two doses of one vaccine? and a third booster of another vaccine. Um, is, is, um, and what do we know about that? So to answer the first question, as far as um, we've uh, we've talked here that the majority of our patients received Pfizer, but all received the messenger RNA vaccines. But what about J and J, um, which is a different type of vaccine? It's not one of the messenger RNA vaccines, but it's an adenoviral vector um, as a mechanism for the vaccine. And so, would that be different? And so, yes, I'd say that we all think and wonder, would there be, does the mechanism change things? What we know is that in the general population, if anything, the efficacy results for the messenger RNA vaccines were higher than they were for the adenoviral um, vaccines. Um, and the second thing I would say is that it's not just about the fact of within COVID, as we know outside of COVID, we think about 
flu vaccination, pneumococcal vaccination, other ones that we have much more data on for many more years, et cetera, we know we see the same thing in transplant patients, that they are less likely to mount an antibody response. So um, I would say is we need to see the data and there will be uh, data that will be published um, on those transplant patients that did receive the J&J vaccine from other centers. Um, but we don't know the answer to it, but I would be surprised if we saw a difference per se, that it was significant, especially one that would be improving. If anything, I think the messenger RNA vaccines are the ones we'd recommend. In terms of the second question, as far as mixing antibody, even in vaccines, excuse me, even going from one Pfizer to a Moderna or J&J after um, you know, mixing them in that way, the data that we have for that comes from mainly the UK currently. And the reason for having that data is not because they were just playing around with this, right? But it was because of the fact that they were using AstraZeneca and due to a side effect from AstraZeneca, they wanted and decided to delay giving us the second dose of it in certain individuals. And so those then got Pfizer as their second dose. Yes, they did in a small percentage, it was a small uh, study so far, but did show that there was perhaps a higher antibody response in mixing those two. I do not think, and I would really caution us to be extrapolating from that little data. I think it is, we will only learn more and more in the coming months about that data, but we are fortunate in the US to not have a supply issue. And so therefore we have been able to follow what we learned in clinical trials. And in clinical trials we know, and also this is still under emergency use authorization, meaning that it's not a full approval for the vaccination. And when it's not a full approval, then we are recommended to not go quote unquote off label and therefore do things differently. And right now, the approval is recommended the way it was studied in trials, which was to do the same vaccines. But there are other trials that are going on to look at this, and I think it'll be very interesting. Right. Um, so a common question that we're getting is, um, how do we get our antibodies tested, and should we get them tested, and what do they mean? Um, and I, I know that you've already gone over that, but if you could just succinctly, um, you know, uh, you know re-emphasize what the thinking is on that. Yeah, so succinctly, I'd say there, there's three reasons why we are not recommending that we routinely check antibodies and give you back the response to the antibodies. A, we know that the most important thing is not whether or not one individual has a positive antibody, because that can be fleeting, that can be changing. There's so many things we don't know about that. Um, it's more important that we look at antibodies in the way we're doing it, for example, in our study of saying across the organ types across all transplant patients, across the you know, lung transplant patients, et cetera. That's really the key thing when we think about immune response in that way. The second reason I would say is because of the fact that these tests have not been validated. The commercial tests that you can order and get a result from have not been validated for vaccination samples. And that is why the FDA and the CDC are recommending that this not be done routinely. And the third thing, third thing I would say is that our recommendations don't change based on the antibody response. If you have a positive antibody response in a healthy person, a, a healthy volunteer compared to a transplant patient, it doesn't mean the fact that we'd say, oh, then you're fine. You can just be act doing everything. So therefore it's not gonna change what we recommend. And it's also not something that we think we can really hang our hat on yet. It's only a portion of the equation. That is why we are not recommending it. Right, and then um, another question is, you know, what are the risks of being vaccinated either of being vaccinated as uh, suggested with two doses of the RNA uh, vaccines or getting a booster uh, a vaccine, what are the risks in terms of developing uh, a response against your allogram? And also, does this have any effect on other infections? Is this more likely to increase your risk of getting CMV or EBV or, uh, or other infections? So the um, good news for uh, this is the fact that we do know, and not just in the studies, but just in the number of uh, transplant patients across the country that have and, and outside of the US that have gotten these vaccines of how safe they are. And it's not surprising because we all always wonder this. So we question this on flu vaccinations as far as giving high dose flu rather than the regular flu. Um, we question this in the Shingrix, the vaccine that we use for uh, to prevent zoster or shingles um, and many others. Will this, will activating your immune system 
then not only prevent the infection from being exposed to the infection, but then also would that then lead to rejection? Though theoretically, you could see where that would be a concern and it has been appropriately studied. We have not seen that to be the case. That doesn't mean though, given that COVID vaccination is relatively new in this regard, that we should be doing it off label. And that's why we mentioned as far as the third dose, that if that were to, um, if we were to recommend that it would be only done under a research setting. And that doesn't mean just to get a third dose and then get your antibodies as part of the research setting, but really being part of a study that is actually monitoring right before and right after you getting a vaccination to make sure that there's no issues. But from what we've seen now for the two dose messenger RNA vaccines or the J&J &J vaccine, there have been no safety from a rejection standpoint or whatnot or whatsoever. The second question you, um, Dr. Chandra Gurethi was about, could it all, uh, increase your chances of developing other viruses or being more susceptible? And no, that is not the case. And um, this is very targeted for this to prevent um, if you were to be exposed to SARS-CoV-2 to then uh, bind to that um, virus and therefore not uh, get allow the infection to occur or whatnot, but it does not interfere, and we've not seen this at all with other uh, other infections. All right, I'm going to just take a couple of seconds to answer some other questions. Um, there's some questions about can you view the recording afterwards with other people? Yes, you can still go to register, and then you'll have access to the recording, so you can view this later, and you can share that uh, the registration button with your friends, and then they'll be able to see the. Uh, recordings of this presentation. Um, there are questions about, um, let's see. actually I'll switch to, an, uh, to another question here. Um, so there's some questions about uh, potential studies. So patients are asking, uh, is it too late to be in the, uh, in the Brigham study to develop, you know, looking at antibodies and um, how do they sign up for that? Um, and are there any studies, I mean, what are you thinking about doing a, bo a booster study? So, um, I guess the first question as far as the, um, can, is it too late to sign up? Um, no, it is not too late. Uh, if anyone is interested and would like to, um, they can contact us and, uh, Stacey, if it's okay, I can, um, make sure that they get information on how to do so um, through you. And so, uh, yes, we are more than happy to still enroll patients in that. And we are still, for those that are currently enrolled, um, doing a longer term follow-up as far as the four month um, studies and we'll be contacting individuals about that. The second uh, part of that I think is with the booster vaccine. And so, yes, um, we have discussed uh, doing this as a study, um, but we are uh, still, there's a lot of regulatory um, things to go through to get approval for that. And so if and when we are able to do that formally, we will um, be sure to let people know. And then um, the questions about um, it are, given that transplant patients are uh, not having the same kind of response to vaccination, uh, should they be concerned about transmission from um, surfaces? And are there differences in the recommendations in terms of the likelihood of catching the virus if you're an immunosuppressed patient versus a non-immunosuppressed patient? So we have not seen that there, if I can do the last question first, that there is um, a greater chance of get being exposed or actually getting affected from uh, COVID if you are, if two people or individuals are exposed to it, um, one being transplantation, one not being. As far as the severity of disease that people have if they are exposed and get COVID, um, though there have been some mixed messages, I guess I would say on that from the different centers, um, some that have seen that, and that's why the CDC does consider this um, uh, transplant patients to be a higher risk um, and have this be an independent severity um, score for that. Uh, but it is uh, not an independent risk factor for that. There's a lot of other things that go into that. And so uh, we don't worry that you are more likely to get the infection. We do worry that if you get it, that you are more likely to be uh, sick from it. Uh, the other question, um, Sorry, Dr. Dr. Willie, can I just clarify your answer to that second question? Were you referring to transplant patients in general who might get COVID infection or transplant patients who have been vaccinated and then have gotten COVID infection? So in other words, for patients who have had a transplant that had been vaccinated, again, we, as we talked about, we aren't checking their antibodies. We assume that they've developed some immunity but in the transplant patients that you've now seen or heard about 
that have then gotten COVID infection. Is there anything different that we've learned about the way those patients present in terms of their symptoms or how they should be treated? Sure, so my, my answer was, um, and maybe I misunderstood the question, was just about in general, so not vaccinated individuals, but just you know, transplant patients is that an independent risk factor for that. To your question, Dr. Uh, Giverts, as far as those that are vaccinated, what have we seen? So it's still very small numbers um, of what we've seen. Um, and you know, we presented as far as in our study that we had three individuals that had COVID after they were fully vaccinated, one who had a positive antibody and two who did not. Um, as far as all three, did well. Uh, when we look at all of our Brigham transplant uh, patients and how many of those got COVID before or after vaccination or during the same time period, let's say since January, that were vaccinated compared to those who were not vaccinated, it seems about equal actually as far as how many um, got required hospitalization for COVID if they were vaccinated compared to if they were not vaccinated. Um, we've, but I would say overall, we've seen good outcomes in our vaccinated patients um, that had transplants or not that do get COVID um, and get admitted to the hospital. As far as what we recommend differently in treatment wise, I'd say it's not necessarily a difference um, if they were to get COVID after vaccination. Uh, it's more what we recommending now in general with our transplant patients about monoclonal antibodies um, and our other therapeutics uh, that we recommend. Thank you. Uh, uh, Dr. Sharma, do you have any comment? No, I think I agree with that, yes. Okay. So, and I think, you know, one of the questions that we get is a little, it's a variation on, you know, what is safe and what is not safe for transplant patients. I think one of the concerns is, you know, uh, transplant patients who have kids or grandkids uh, who are under the age of 12 and are not being vaccinated and are now still going to get exposed, uh, theoretically. Um, what advice do you have for, for those patients? Yeah, so I think that that's a common question, uh, and I think it's something that is going to continue to be uh, the case since we don't expect individuals, or we don't expect the, the studies to come out for um, those under uh, 12 years old to be able to uh, get approval for the vaccination until later this summer, early fall. And so I would say the first thing I would say is I think it's fortunate that this is happening as we go into the summertime, um, as we are then more likely to be doing more and more outdoor activities. I would just recommend the fact that uh, it's really, to me, no different than being around other adults um, in, that are not in your household uh, as far as the measures you should take. The only difference would be the fact that we at least know that children are less likely to get severe cases of COVID or whatnot, which means the fact not just that it is less likely for the child to get sick from it, but therefore it is less likely for them to transmit it. It doesn't mean that they can't, and you still need to be very careful. And I would treat them the same way as you would treat an unvaccinated adult that's outside of your household. But I think you can have some reassurance with the fact that they are less likely to be transmitting. And so I think wearing a mask, if you were to be around them indoors and that having them wear a mask as well would be uh, prudent. And then um, hopefully having more and more outdoor activities. Okay, great. So um, there are some questions about the presentation. I think um, we're getting questions about whether we could share the charts that you made. So I know we need to correct that chart a little bit. I was going to say, I can't, I can't I share continue. until I correct it. I apologize for that confusion. Right. Oh. <laughs> I'm so sorry. No <laughs> I, I need to explain to everybody that Anne did this very, very quickly. We, we just completed getting the data in and she's just really worked uh, tirelessly to put this information together for everybody. So we, we're really thankful to her. But um, we will correct the chart. And I'm just wondering where we can post this. And um, Stacey, I don't know if you can go out with the questionnaire or if we're going to put it on the site somewhere. Um, but we will figure out a way and let everybody know who's on this. Um, you know, how to get access to that. We'll make it available somehow. Um, there, are, there are a lot of individual questions that are sort of really dealing with individual circumstances. Uh, the ones that we have not been able to get to, uh, we will try to, to send a response to individually um, uh, as much as we possibly can. Uh, I, I don't know that there's anything else that we can very quickly cover here. I just really wanted to sort of um, hand it over to Dr. Sherman, Dr. Givers to ask them if they had anything else they wanted to add or any information that they wanted to share. All of us, I think, you know, I think it's been very difficult for patients to uh, understand what they should and shouldn't be doing. 
and getting individualized responses about their own individual circumstances has been tough. But we would encourage you, and we will try to make ourselves as available as possible to answer those for you. And in 30 seconds, Michael or Nirmal. Oh, no, that's, that's the most important point is I was reading through the questions. Um, everyone's situation is different. How many years out from your transplant, what your medications are, what um, uh, vaccination you got, what side effects you've had. And so please call your doctor, your nurse. We're here to help you to answer your questions. If we don't know the answer to the question, uh, we, will, we will find Dr. Woolley usually or one of her colleagues uh, who will do their best to answer the question so we can get back to you as soon as possible. Um, you know, um, we may not have the, the answer right away, but we'll do our best to get it for you. So that's just my uh, closing comment, because I saw all those wonderful questions that came in. I'm sorry we couldn't get to them. Yeah, I'll have, I have the same thing from the lung transplant program. If you have questions which are specific to your work, going back to work, or anything pertaining to your household, I would highly encourage you, send a message to your clinical coordinator, and we may be able to answer that via the, email, the text or uh, patient gateway, or if it needs more of a discussion, we're happy to have the discussion with you. And of course, if we, know, if we don't know the answer, we'll get the right authority to help us with that. And you know, there's a chance that we may not know all the answers, but we'll certainly try to help. Great, so I think with that, I'd again like to thank my very hardworking colleagues, Dr. Givitz, Dr. Sharma, and Dr. Woolley, especially to Stacy for putting this together with the National Kidney Foundation. We will compile a list of questions and between us, we'll get to them, but you need to give us a little bit of time. I don't want my colleagues to be slaving over this over Memorial Day uh, weekend, um, but we will try to get responses out to you early next week. Thank you very much, everybody, for joining us today. And we look forward to seeing you at our next Kidney Crossroads. Thank you, everybody.